Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Rita Horner, who's going to talk today about some of the challenges that are facing the very large data centers and what they're doing about it. Rita, as the amount of data increases and as d data centers have to move more of this data around, they're running into some major challenges. They're growing in every different direction. What are you seeing as some of the big challenges that they're facing and how do they go about solving them? So some of the major challenges they're facing today is scalability, being able to scale fast and low cost. Because if you are ramping very fast, you don't have the time to start planning for facilities or systems or being able to access some of these boxes that they need to upgrade their system very quickly in a timely manner. So those are some of the challenges. And this is not just a chip-related challenge, right? It's a full systemic challenge of moving data at a, at a very high speed across potentially some fairly significant distances. That's correct. That's correct. It's not just a chip, which is the, addressing the problem on the electrical side of things, but there are a whole bunch of cabling, could be copper cabling, could be optical cabling. It's the facilities, the cooling, the air conditioning, the management, the IT support system, or automation technologies that need, they need to be put in place to support that. Why don't you draw some of this out for us? Sure. So what are we looking at here? So I'm going to just walk through what I'm talking about in terms of data centers. An enterprise, any business, a sizable independent uh, of what end product they have, what kind of business they are in, or the customer needs that they may have. Over time, as they grow in size, they need access to bigger and bigger data center. Now, these data centers are mainly computing facilities for processing and storage. So you have storage devices and you have servers and switches and CPUs in these data centers. But over time, you can add more and more system, which means you can expand horizontally, expand out by adding more and more these. But then you may run out of space. Over time, you could also potentially scale out where you add more and more powerful devices, systems, and machineries to be able to do your processing. But it gets to a point that adding more of the same device to get the higher data throughput or have, having faster systems are very cap expensive. So this is still the same kind of issues that designers are working on on chips, right? Where you, But it's just done at a much larger scale. It's still basically an implementation of a von Neumann architecture on a grand scale. That's exactly right. It's scalability. You're running to a bottleneck of being able to efficiently scale out uh, to be able to add more bandwidth and processing and storage. And that's where the cloud computing comes into process. So where are you seeing the bottlenecks today? Is it um, moving the data within the cloud? Is it moving the data to the cloud? Is it moving the data from rack to rack within an enterprise? It's actually all of the above. What is the bottleneck is scalability. And in terms of doing faster processing within the data center, being able to get the data to the cloud or these mega data centers, and how efficiently you can get the data there, store it and process it, and how quickly you can scale that. And is a single pipe better than multiple pipes? You've got um, multiple op options down there. That's right. What's happening is currently the hyperscale data centers, these are mega data center or mega cloud um, environment, they are operating in 100 gigabit per second aggregated links. This is the 100 gig links from data center to data center or within the data center connection from rack to rack or room to room or building to building adjacent to them. And as the technology now is advancing to 400 gig link availability, which this 400 gig could be 16 of the existing 25 gig that allows the data centers to aggregate to a 400 gig link or upgrading to the 50 gig ethernet links that would allow them to just use 80 link instead of 16 links. So effectively the 
width of the connectors, the interconnects, is shrinking, which means there are fewer cables to manage and take care of. Lower power as well from one to the next, or is that still the same? Actually, that's a very good point. Yes, it would be lower power because as we are going from 25 gig to 50 gig, the optical modules, especially that are going to enable the 400 gig, they're not targeted to have twice the power. They're actually going to be much lower than twice the power. So that means the interconnect would be a lower power. And as we move into a smaller technology nodes, that allows us even further power reduction, which means our cooling cost is going to be reduced also. Not everything gets upgraded at the same time, too. Is all of this backward compatible? Can you run uh, 450s and in addition to two 100 uh, links? Actually, in these mega data centers, everything gets upgraded. Um, these hyperscale data centers are all about scalability and standardization on automation. So it would be almost like a forklift upgrade. Everything would be moving from 100 gig to 400 gig. Even though at the edge, there may be some devices that may be still utilizing the current 25 gig or the, even the 10 gig connection to the access layers. But for the whole cloud-based data centers upgrading to 400 gig, it would be a forklift upgrade and everything has to be. So that actually brings a very challenging point because once these hyperscale data centers upgrade to 400 gig, they need access to a large volumes of these interconnects. They need access to optical modules in a very large quantities. We're talking about thousands of servers that goes in one of these cloud data centers. So they have to have availability in the market for these hyperscale data center service providers to be able to upgrade to these higher data rates. So if you have an enterprise operating at 100 gig and you've got the, the cloud operation operating at 400 gig, does that have any impact? Not really. It's just a matter of processing. And um, you effectively are having a gigantic pipe that may be branched to smaller pipes to still provide water in that aspect. And so basically you're the slowest point in any of these operations is going to be your limiter, right? That's correct. That's right. So why don't we drill down into what's going on in the individual data centers? Sure. So effectively a data center consists of compute processing. So effectively you need um, central processing units and you need storages. That's the main um, content within data center. Now, over time, within the latest technology, we have accelerators and we have machine learning and all these other heavy intensive processing that are happening in the data centers. But then to be able to have a mega data center, or in the case of the cloud or hyperscale, you have many of these data centers that are networked together. And what is happening in the architecture of the data centers, as you might have heard, they have moved from a three-layer tier um, networking to a flatter, more efficient two-tier leaf and spine. And what is mean by leaf and spine, so you effectively have spine switches that are connecting the data centers together. And then within the data center, you have leaf switches that connect the rows and rows or the rooms and rooms of data centers within one device to be connected to the spine. And if in this way, you're able to have every server connected to every server through the leaf and every server to any other server in other data center through the spine switches. And this is basically load management of the data, right? That's really what this is all about. That's right. Effectively, you're running an out of bandwidth here or computing. You could move your um, application on a different data center and continue processing. And these links are all very high speed. As I was mentioning, these are about 100 uh, gigabit per second links between the data center that are now transitioning to the 400 gig interconnects. These are fiber optics connection. Uh, all of them, because a lot of these data centers being so huge, there are over acres and acres of land, and there may be even multi-tier, 
uh, in terms of flooring of the data center, they may be anywhere from 10 kilometers to 40 kilometers away from each other. And so these are all single mode fiber interconnects connecting these data centers. Now, you may not need the expensive single mode fibers within the data center where you're connecting your racks to racks. With that much data moving and that much data being processed, is the heat becoming a problem now inside these data centers as well? And how does that affect the connections? So the heat has been an issue and the cooling system need has been there. Um, there are more and more clever ways of cooling these data centers. A lot of times um, these devices are getting um, designed to be able to handle a higher temperature. So these data centers can actually utilize more of an ambient, more of an environment cooling system. Sometimes they're actually building these data centers in a much colder environment to also manage that. So there, a lot of these service providers are really reaching out to the different techniques of cooling. But yes, cooling does become a challenge as you're adding more and more power hungry devices or systems in your data centers. But the whole push from the data center providers are to get to lower, lower power devices and servers and storage that can address their need and does not require them to upgrade their entire cooling system. I know in, in the engineering field, we never think of never as a, a, an impossible as uh, real words, but is it getting to the point where we're hitting maximum movements of data, where we have to start rethinking the architectures of the systems themselves as opposed to how the data moves? I think we are because a lot of the activities that are happening um, in order for them to get processed, they need to reach to these data centers. And there may be long latencies, even though we're talking about the speed of light going through fiber optics, but again, the round trip can be in a um, few milliseconds or microseconds even that may not be um, tolerable by some of the applications that need faster turnaround time. So there are new technologies that are actually expanding these data centers to bring closer to the source of the data generation need or data processing, which they call it edge computing. And the edge is becoming a part of this too now because now you can start segmenting where the processing is done as opposed to putting it all into ever larger data centers, right? That's right. So you, you can bring your data in and then process it where you need it, very fast processing. And then when you're done with it, you could store it back. Maybe for authentication or verification, you may reach out to the data center. But then again, what is happening is the processing is getting more distributed to get closer and closer to the edge where the access layers are. So what do you have to change in the infrastructure to support these faster data speeds? So in order to be able to make this faster throughput bandwidth increase um, more affordable and scalable, um, the data centers are not able to all utilize single mode fiber, which tends to be more expensive, almost two or three times or even 10 times more expensive than the multi-mode fiber would be. So there are interfaces, capabilities for connecting within the data centers with multi-mode fiber that tend to go much shorter reaches than the single mode. So the single mode fiber may go anywhere from 10 to 40 kilometers between data centers, especially for the 100 gig. Now, we are challenged right now with 400 gig because right now IEEE has only defined a 10 kilometer and in the process of upgrading that 10 kilometer to go beyond 10 kilometer with two of the new standards that the working groups are working on in IEEE 802.3. But at the same time, to keep the co cost down, we're talking about multi-mode fiber. Right now, there is no standard for 400 gig multi-mode fiber. And that's another initiative that is just started in IEEE to start defining. Because at the 100 gig, we had capability of using 100 meters at least of multi-mode fiber, either in a fiber short reach connection or as an active optical um, cabling. Optical, uh, where you actually have electrical interface, you don't have optical AOC um, cabling to connect from your rack to rack. Now, to keep the cost down, a lot of times these rack connection of the server to the top of the rack switch 
or from rack to rack, from an edge, edge to edge, or middle of the rack to the middle rack. In 100 gig, we were able to use five meter of a direct attach copper. And the 400 gig world, we actually had to shrink this because the losses of copper goes higher as you go higher data rate. And we are looking at the three meter. So all it is enough is just connecting from bottom of a rack or middle of the rack to the top of the rack or barely side by side. But again, copper is a lot cheaper than the optical uh, modules or even the AOCs to be able to support this interconnect. Now, behind all these, um, then you're talking more going inside the servers, you're talking about chip to chip, you have um, connections between board to boards to, across a backplane and backplane, PC board traces and connectors, those all have different losses. And you have different specs that are, needs to be met in order to be able to drive these different type of channels to be able to achieve these throughputs. And that loss manifests itself both in terms of signal integrity as well as heat, right? That's correct, yes. Um, and also latency for that matter. Um, copper tends to be very um, much cheaper in magnitudes cheaper than optical module, but the latency is higher across the copper. Um, it generates more heat than the optical module. There is signal integrity issues like you pointed out. There is more issues uh, in terms of EMI with copper and then PC board traces than in, that would be in the fiber optics. But at the same time, so you're balancing the trade-off between going very expensive using all optical for connections. We're talking about even optical backplanes bringing the optic even closer to where the switches are happening, where the ICs are happening, uh, doing all the processing, doing onboard optics effectively, instead of bringing the, using the pluggable optical modules, you're actually bringing the optical module closer. And then, as we talked about, it could also be silicon photonics, where you're co-packaging the optics with the switch on the same IC, or that piece in the same package. Rita Horner, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you for this opportunity.